it's now time to get started. So I would like to wish you all a very warm welcome to our webinar on climate change adaptation and reporting best practice, which has been produced in partnership with the Consumer Council for Water and very generously supported by WRC PLC. I'm Terry Fuller, the Chief Executive at SIWEM, the Chartered Institution of Water and Environmental Management. For those who aren't familiar with SIWEM, welcome. We're a Royal Chartered professional institution representing a community of thousands of water and environmental management professionals and organisations right across the world. At SIWEM, our vision is a safer, sustainable world. And we're all about working in an integrated way, bringing multidisciplinary skill sets to bear on the really knotty, multidimensional challenges that exist in the midst of the climate, nature and sustainability emergencies. So if we're new to you and new to us and you like today's event, do get in touch. We'd be delighted to hear from you and we'll share details about how you can do that later on. Now, 2021 will be a critical year for adaptation in the UK and a very exciting one as well. In the year that the UK hosts COP26, where one of the government's priorities for the summit is to put climate adaptation and resilience at the heart of everything we do. The Climate Change Committee will also publish their biennial progress report on preparing for climate change and an evidence report which will inform the UK government's third climate change risk assessment. DEFRA have also set a deadline of December 2021 for reporting organisations to submit their reports under the third round of the climate change adaptation reporting power. These reports are an important way of assessing how prepared organisations are for our changing climate. But inconsistencies in reports across organisations and across sectors in the previous rounds means that it has been difficult to understand what actions are being taken and where progress is lacking. So in our first session this morning, we'll hear from the experts on why adaptation is so crucial how progress on it is going so far, and why we need to up the pace and scale. Using experience from industry, the second session this morning, we'll look at how organisations get the most out of the adaptation reporting process, what and what best practice looks like. As organisations start to produce their reports, encouraging submissions to be of consistently good quality and to include the right information will ensure that they can be used effectively to measure and monitor adaptation progress and preparation in the UK. We'll be asking how the ARP submissions can be used to drive change. Now we have four great speakers for you in our first session of the morning. Uh, Professor Stephen Belcher from the Met, so he's the Met Office Chief Scientist. He'll open things up for us with a look at what the science shows about why adaptation is so important. Following on from Stephen, Chris Stark, Chief Executive of the Climate Change Committee, is joining us to give his assessment on progress for preparing for climate change. We'll then be joined by Mike Keel from the Consumer Council for Water to, to, to talk about why adaptation matters to consumers and how organisations can reassure their customers that they are preparing for the challenges of climate change. And to complete the first session, Francis Pimenta from DEFRA will join us to talk about how DEFRA will use the ARP submissions to progress adaptation and their ambitions for the next decade. Now, after our first four speakers, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask some of them questions. After a short break, we'll then have six experienced reporters from a range of sectors giving their view on best practice for ARP submissions and how they use the process to mobilise change within their organisations and progress adaptation. And this will be followed by a panel Q&A session. 
Now, before we launch into our talks this morning, a quick bit of housekeeping. We'll be splitting this two hour session into two sessions. We'll hear from all of the speakers in each session and at the end of each session, we'll take your questions. We want you to pose the questions to our speakers as well as to see and comment on what other people are asking. Now, the best place for you to do this will be using the Slido. You will notice on the left hand side of your screen next to the chat, there is a tab for Slido. You can submit your question within the Q&A session at any time during the presentation and hit the thumbs up to promote the questions submitted by others. You can also interact with each other and comment on any active questions in Slido by hitting reply underneath the question. Now we also have a short poll which is running on Slido too. A few questions which we hope you'll take a couple of minutes to answer. The poll will stay live during the event, but also for the rest of the day if you want to go in later. Now, after the first speakers are finished at around half past 10, we'll have a five minute comfort break and return for the second session and we'll wrap up at 11.30 sharp. After we conclude the webinar, we will invite you to visit our exhibitor booths, our CCW, WIC and our SIWEM membership and learning and development teams will also be ready and waiting to speak to you. There will also be a speed networking session open up so you can meet other attendees. Now, without further ado, it's time to introduce you to our first speaker, Professor Stephen Belcher. As the Met Office Chief Scientist and Technology Officer, Stephen provides leadership at Met Office Science and Technology, leading on the implementation of the research and innovation strategy. Stephen led the evolution of the Met Office Hadley Centre to focus on climate science and services. He was a driving force behind the initiation of Newton Fund's Climate Science for Service Partnership, China, in which scientists from both China and the UK are now working together to develop fundamental climate science and climate services. Stephen, over to you. Well, brilliant. Thank you very much, Terry, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to uh, everyone this morning. Um, as Terry described, what we've got in front of us is a real massive challenge here uh, in adapting to climate change. And so the element of that puzzle that I'd like to present on this morning is really the hazard. So what, what will the weather throw at us um, in this changing climate? And clearly that's, that's where the Met Office has some expertise to offer this complicated arena. So I can move my slides on. So I'd like to start just with a few slides to describe um, what we describe as what we call UKCP, so the UK National Climate Projections. And the latest iteration of these was launched in 2018. It's a joint um, endeavor by DEFRA, Bayes, Met Office and Environment Agency. And uh, we had enormous uh, user community engagement in designing this, uh, this product. And what UKCP18 provides is a set of projections for over the UK, uh, for sea level, and of course it includes observations of past and present climate to complement future projections. The main messages from these projections remain unchanged from previous iterations, namely uh, winters will become warmer and wetter. Uh, you've probably heard that message before. But really the innovation in UKCP18 is that we're able to describe the weather conditions that sit under that broad change in climate. So we've got two charts here. On the left-hand side is temperature in the winter over England, and on the right-hand side is rainfall or precipitation uh, in England during winters. And the vertical axes on each of these are the change in either temperature or precipitation. And then along the x-axis horizontally, we've got the year from 1900 through to present day and then out into 2100. In each case, the black lines show observations of what has actually happened. Uh, and then the blue line is the average of the change under our changing climate uh, for temperature and rainfall. And as I said, the, the, the blue line here is really average, is it? And that's what we used to talk about in climate change. 
But I think you can see on those charts some faint blue lines and faint orange lines. So those are the actual conditions in year of the weather conditions provided by UKCP. So we're not forecasting when these weather conditions will happen. We're saying what's the character of the weather conditions that we'll see in these uh, future climate. And the contrast I wanted to draw between these two charts is on the left hand side, you can see temperature and temperature is increasing as a band showing these warmer, warmer winters, but you can see the range of temperatures is broadly uh, constant through that, that period. So staying about the same as the range of temperatures we experience in present day climate. If we contrast that to the right hand side, I think what you can see is that we're still living with the dry winters, so the lower values of the rainfall that we're seeing in the future. So whilst the average is increasing, the dry winters remain dry. But you can see from the upper fan of those pale blue and pink lines uh, that the wet winters get wetter. So we're seeing an expansion in the range of conditions that we'll need to adapt to. So, so that's one of my key messages. Yes, we need to adapt to warmer, wetter winters, but in some of the variables, rainfall in this example, we need to adapt to a wider range of conditions. If we turn very briefly to summer now, um, you'll have heard again the message hot, dry summers uh, under a changing climate. And here's the example uh, of the summer 2018 heat wave, which um, happened immediately prior actually to us launching UKCP18. And the chart here gives, a, gives a, a kind of indication of how those conditions have changed over time. <clears throat> so if we go back to 1990, this was really quite a rare event. 2018, it's more like a one in five event. And by 2050, this is looking like a normal summer. So a 50-50 chance of those events. And then by 2090, we begin to see a much more differentiated occurrence depending on what we do uh, to, to mitigate climate. So what do we do to emissions? And I think Chris Stark may pick up on this uh, in his presentation later. Under low emissions, uh, it will remain a 50-50 event, but under higher emissions, you can see it's almost becoming uh, every summer looks like that. So we're beginning to see the effects of what we do now on uh, the conditions we may have to adapt to towards the end of century. Very briefly, just to end this brief introduction to, to the weather conditions under a cha changing climate, I wanted to just give um, sight of a new uh, product that we're able to offer at the Met Office, which is looking at present day conditions. So we know climate has changed. And so the question is, what could present conditions, present climate throw at us? And in particular, could it throw, us, throw at us? What's the chances of present climate throwing us conditions that we've never seen before. In order to help us with that, we've got observations of past climate, but that's relatively short, particularly because the climate is changing, of course. So what we do is we complement the observations of recent climate with synthetic uh, present day climate from our model simulations. And what you're seeing here is some work we submitted to a Royal Society report on future of energy storage. And what we're looking at is uh, wind generation of energy over the North Sea. So the little inset there shows you the box we're looking at in the North Sea. And we're looking at um, December, January, February wind conditions over that area. And you can see on the chart, we're looking at conditions from about 1960 to uh, present day. And we're asking the question, what's the chance of getting very low wind conditions in that uh, winter period under present climate. Uh, you can see there's a dark black dot, which I hope my pointer is, able, is um, illustrating here, which is the lowest on record. And using this combination of observations plus model, we're able to say what's the chance in the future of seeing a very low wind condition, which of course would limit the renewable supply that we might um, be able to provide. Putting all of that together, we're seeing that there's a 1% chance in every year that the North Sea region might have a, a monthly average wind speed that's lower than anything we've seen. So really what we're trying to get at here is under present day climate, there are risks that we need to adapt to that we may not have seen before. I've given the example of low wind speed. We can do a similar analysis. We call it the unseen method. There's a glorified acronym that sits underneath that but it's unseen conditions. We can apply it to rainfall, 
uh, temperature and you're seeing it here for wind. So I can see Terry back on screen. So that's my prompt just to wrap up. So my final slide, um, perhaps I can leave you with is that the UKCP provides a consistent source of um, information on weather conditions under the future climate that, that might help folk um, provide adaptation planning. The broad message is a hot, dry summer, warmer, wetter winters, but what UKCP provides is a, a lot more detail under that and the envelope of conditions we will need to adapt to, we think is expanding. And then finally, even under present climate, there are things out there that nature hasn't yet thrown us, which we think it could well do. So we need to just be prepared for those as well. And with that, I'll say thank you to Terry and, and the team for organizing this and thank you for your attention. Stephen, thank you very much. That, that was tremendous and really has uh, set the scene uh, very nicely in, in the imperatives that we face. Thank, thank you. Um, I can see that some questions are starting to come through, but please do use the Slido to submit, submit your questions and also to promote up and down those that, uh, that you would really like to be asked. OK, it's now time to move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Chris Stark, who is Chief Executive of the Climate Change Committee which is the UK's statutory advisor on tackling climate change. Chris led the committee's work in 2019 to recommend a new net zero target for the UK, which is now brought into law. He speaks regularly on the transition to a net zero economy. Chris, over to you. Hi, Terry. And the first gremlin is that I can't actually show my video. So I'm going to try and work out how to do that, Terry, while I, while I filibuster for a second. So um, uh, I don't know whether tech support can help me with that, but the, 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 uh, the, uh, the option to do it has disappeared from my screen. Why don't I do it without video? And then uh, you can hear me as a ghostly voice because I, um, I can certainly do so. So as long as you can hear me, I think that's fine. Um, uh, well, here we are. I've been offered the chance to start my video. That's wonderful. Great. Can you see me, Terry? Uh, yes, see think you and hear you loud think and clear you can. as well. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Great. Well, look, I only have eight minutes, so I'm going to um, I'm going to keep this uh, nice and and punchy if I can. And um, uh, let me just start by saying that uh, we're talking about adaptation reporting this morning, and it is absolutely a key component of the UK's armory when it comes to tackling climate change. But it is frankly an area. Uh, where we could do better. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the next seven minutes or so. And I'm going to pick up where Stephen uh, Belcher left off with some of the advice that we presented in December in our sixth carbon budget advice about the global commitments to cut emissions and their implications. And um, this is a, a chart that we, that we published uh, just a few weeks back. Uh, and this, this is looking at the implication of the current uh, emissions targets for 2030. So we look at the NDCs as they're known, the National Commitments for Cutting Greenhouse Gas Emissions. This is the projection for temperature uh, that, is the, that is implied by those commitments. Now, it, it, is, it is taking us to uh, warming by the end of the century of between three and four degrees centigrade. And uh, that is pretty disturbing. Uh, now, it's worth saying that that has come down over recent years, because that's a testament to what's been happening with climate commitments and climate policy. But the mistake here is in thinking that we're going to wish all this away by focusing on net zero. And we're going to hear a lot about net zero this year in the run up to the COP. But this is the implication of where we are at present from those NDCs. And if I just roll on to the next chart, this is a nice chart that shows you what we will get if the world shifts, as I desperately hope it will, to that rapid decarbonisation scenario that's implied by the Paris Agreement. This is the implication of net zero by mid-century for the developed economies, 2070 for the world as a whole. And you can see that that is a quite a significant change from the chart I just showed you. Uh, it takes us to much lower levels of warming. So, uh, you know, less than two is the goal that we're looking for here. But crucially, we are still going to need to adapt to temperature change and the climate changes that come with that. Uh, and there are still, even in this, uh, in this rapid decarbonisation scenario, there are still high warming scenarios, which will bring big challenges. So. The big message to start with is that net zero is not the free pass that sometimes I think it is presented as. So if we just move on then to, to just to pick up actually many of the th things that, that Stephen talked about, this is another take on the evidence of the possible impacts for the UK across different um, mitigation pathways 
um, that we have. This is based on the work that we did for the second climate change risk assessment. We're updating this for the third climate change risk assessment, which we'll be publishing in July. So let's just take a moment to reflect on this. The, the first column here is looking at where we are now. The UK is already warmed by 1.2 degrees centigrade above where we were prior to industry really taking off, slightly more than the global average, which is interesting. That's already making heat waves a much more common occurrence than they were before, just as Stephen said. If we move on to um, mid-century and even on this optimistic path, I know we will all want to be on if we follow that path I just talked about for global emissions, we're still going to have to adapt to 50% chance of a 2018 heat wave every year, 10% less rainfall in the summer, 10% increase in heavy rainfall, higher seas. This is the inevitable change that is definitely coming. So already we can start to ponder whether we're really ready for that kind of change by 2050, but we should also be prudent. So we've got to look beyond that. So looking at a two degree world, um, a two degree world is not one we want to be in, but we're going to have more warming, even less water availability in the summer, 20% increase in heavy rainfall, strikingly higher seas. And then four degrees is, I'm afraid, a world that we also have to consider. Just look at the four degree impacts that I've got on this table here for you. So three degrees centigrade of warming from where we are today, 2018 heat, wave, heat waves almost every year, shocking fall in summer rainfall, and similarly shocking increase in, in damaging heavy rainstorms uh, and over a meter of sea level rise potentially. Now, this is a very plausible outcome. And that's not, of course, what we wish to see, but it's the kind of outcome in infrastructure terms that really has to be considered and planned for. Why then do we ignore it, is my question. Why is two degrees centigrade the, the kind of planning assumption that is mostly considered when this is actually at the optimistic end of the spectrum? Surely, given the year that we've just had, it's time to get real about what lies ahead. So let's talk about that now and move on to the, uh, the governance framework for adaptation. Now, a few words from me on this. When the Climate Change Act was conceived, there was a great deal of good foresight uh, in the way that it was drafted, particularly about the institutional arrangements and the reporting framework uh, for emissions reduction and also for adaptation. But, and I don't say this lightly, it is simply not delivering the same kind of outcomes on adaptation as it, sh as it is on, on mitigation. I think there are genuine weaknesses in the way that the governance works in the UK, and it largely revolves around the same sort of topics, the lack of mandatory requirements to act, uh, the looser arrangements that there are for independent scrutiny for adaptation versus mitigation. Also, of course, the un unattractive politics of, of acting on adaptation. We are into our third cycle now of, uh, of climate change risk assessments uh, and the sixth cycle of the UK climate change projections. Uh, that, that, is, that is a great process it's not yet delivering the kind of outcomes that we need to see. Crucially, the UK is not prepared for that two degree world, let alone the four degree world. So when we've looked at that, we've seen lots of sectors that have good adaptation plans in place, but no sector at all yet showing good progress in actually reducing those risks. So this is the year to change all of that. And I think the adaptation reported pair is absolutely central to improving that overall outcome. So just in this final section, uh, just a, a few takes on that before we go into the next section. And um, yeah, just a few things uh, to say more on, on the adaptation reporting and why I think it is important. Well, it's very obviously a, a, a huge benefit to the government because of the, uh, and by extension, citizens in this country, because we're helping to build and ensure much more systematic climate change risk management. Uh, we're building better assurance that public services uh, and our infrastructure in this country is genuinely resilient to climate change. Uh, we're going to have better information on the level of preparedness in the key sectors, not the hodgepodge that we have now. And of course, we're helping to make adaptation assessment and that governance under the Climate Change Act better. We, we in the CCC are going to be able to do better scrutiny with better information from the reporting that we'll get from this. Um, and for reporters themselves, probably more important, reporting is, of course, a way to demonstrate climate leadership. So if you are a reporting organisation, this is a great way to do it. But more important than that, is going to help to systematize the, uh, the identification of the climate risks and the, a proper assessment of how they're being managed. Now, we don't see that at the moment. It's going to reduce our organization's vulnerability to climate change. That's an obvious thing to say, but with it, there will be cost reductions. So we're, we're reducing the cost of inaction later. Uh, we're going to encourage, by doing this, a broader engagement with other sectors, and that's going to help identify where there are those inter interdependencies that often are the biggest risk here overall the cascading risks, as they're sometimes referred to. And it presents clear as day where the big barriers lie in responding to climate change. Also, some of the opportunities that come from climate change, it's okay to talk about that. 
Uh, and of course, it provides a much more transparent platform for others to learn from. So that's the kind of key point when it comes to reporting organizations. And just a final point from me, Terry, before I hand back to you. Um, this is a, a nice chart that just shows you uh, where we got to with the 84 reports that were submitted in the last round of adaptation reporting. Uh, and this is broadly what we found. Firstly, look at the poor response rate by the, by the, by the first deadline. Um, uh, secondly, most reports that we got described the nature of risks. That was good. Some usefully quite, quant quite usefully quantified, ranked and aligned. Um, but we couldn't build an overall picture of the climate change risk and opportunities at the national and the regional level, nor the sector level, to feed into our work for the second climate change risk assessment. And that's a problem. That was mainly due to the timing of reporting, which doesn't align well with the climate change risk assessment cycle. So for me, that's something that needs to be addressed. It's a huge missed opportunity, just a timing issue. Uh, we don't see a lack of good or consistent quantification of the risks and the impact of the adaptation actions. And there are big gaps, frankly, in the risk assessment that we see across those uh, 80 or so uh, reports, especially on those interdependencies. In general, there was much more that we thought could be done to identify and prioritize the key actions that could, in these reports. So that's the thing I'd like to, to put to this audience that we should work on. And the final slide for me, Terry, just thinking about best practice when it comes to reporting. Again, adaptation reporting really should be, I think, at the heart of a better adaptation cycle in the UK, mim mimicking where, we get, where we're getting to now on the emissions reduction side under the Climate Change Act. Uh, here are five broad pieces of advice to develop best practice. Hopefully this will set us up nicely. The first is the most important. We need to get real about where we're heading with temperature change. So assessing current and future climate change risks at two and four degrees centigrade. And of course, the relevant timescales need to be attached to those temperature outcomes. Secondly, let's define the magnitude of potential impacts to the reporting organization. For many of you, the financial reporting requirements of TCFD are gonna to lead to this kind of more quantified outcome in any case. So this is just gonna be good practice. Thirdly, please use time series data on weather-related impacts. We've just heard Stephen brilliantly cover some of this, uh, but the impacts on the assets and the services that are supplied by your organization Fourthly, make those plans for adaptation as smart as they can be. Uh, we need a monitoring framework alongside that. And lastly, number five, let's identify and manage those interdependencies between the risks. That's, that's the really important thing that is often missed, the very real cascade risks between those, those risks that we've seen out notably in, in Texas just recently. And I'll just add just a, a handful, a couple of thoughts before I finish. We're going to need to move, I think, to mandatory reporting, something that I've said before and our organization have said before. Uh, we can do that in a way that, 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 that is not a burden. We can target that strategically so it doesn't become the burden that I think ministers concerned it will be. It will reveal a host of benefits to the reporting organization as well. I've said it already, but a quick one is also to align the reporting better with the adaptation assessment and planning cycle. Uh, and let's very finally have, have best practice that becomes business as usual. We should have an approach that is sector focused if we can, reporting to the tailored needs of each sector. It needn't be that burden. It should become uh, the, no the normal practice. And if it does so, I think there's huge benefits in doing so, Terry. Back to you. Chris, that's excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And really strong message to, to leave us uh, with takeaway. Um, I'm gonna move uh, on now to our next speaker, who's Mike Keel. Um, uh, Mike uh, will talk to us about why all this matters to consumers. Uh, Mike is the Consumer Council for Water Head of Policy and Research. Uh, he spent the first decade of his career at the Met Office and led its Middle Atmosphere Research Group. In 2007, he joined Ofwat as its first Head of Climate Change Policy, and he wrote their first policy statement on the topic and their 2010 Climate Change ARP report. Mike then moved to Seven Trent Water in 2011, where he wrote the business case for the Birmingham Resilience Project and was heavily involved in their 2015 climate change ARP report. Now, I'm told that Mike currently has toothache and he might be a bit grumpy, but um, don't let that stop you asking him some difficult questions because I'm sure that will take his mind off it. So, so Mike, over to you. Thanks, Terry. Uh, yeah, I've got a double root canal that was supposed to be this morning and I've put off till tomorrow. Um, but that's not what you want to know about the uh, cowboy dentists that exist during the age of COVID. Um, so 
I'm here to talk about uh, adaptation from a consumer perspective. Now, I just want to start by saying, imagine playing a game of football without a ball. It'd be totally pointless. And that's how I view the climate change adaptation reports without focusing on consumers. Now, you might not share that view, but climate change matters to every single person. As it affects our, it will affect our way of life. And when it comes to utilities, it will affect the essential services that we rely on and the price we pay for those services. And that's why, as a consumer body for the, for the water sector in England, is England and Wales, climate change is a priority topic for CCW. So why engage consumers on climate change adaptation? And what difference will it make? I mean, that's a crucial point. It's got to actually make a difference. It's not engagement for the sake of it or some sort of tick box exercise. This is what I'm going to explore over the next few minutes. The points I'm going to make are, are focused on the water sector, but many of them apply to other sectors too, particularly other regulated uh, utilities. So a couple of years ago, so James Bevan, the chief executive of the Environment Agency, made the famous Jaws of Death speech, and that speech brought out significant, brought significant attention to climate change and water issues and by some very colourful use of language, which, was, which I very much welcomed. And that speech, he said that the missing ingredient to the coalition needed to escape the jaws of death was, was, was the public, was consumers. And in fact, he said that they were the most ing important ingredient of all. And I couldn't agree more. And I don't think we talk enough about the role that people can play. Now, James Bevan is talking about engaging and empowering uh, the public in terms of water efficiency. And of course, that was in the context of a speech that was talking about water resources and the impending supply demand gap that is, that is on the horizon. But when you consider the wider perspective on climate change adaptation, so not just water resources, all the other things that can affect utilities, for example, the need to involve consumers is even greater. And that's why the climate change adaptation reports present a massive opportunity to kickstart that much needed engagement and empowerment of consumers. So let's explore this in a bit more detail. We've already mentioned behavior change when it comes to water efficiency, but behavior change isn't just tied to, to water efficiency. There's also what we put down our loos when it comes to water, sewer misuse, putting the wrong thing down the toilets or fat soils and greases down our sinks. It's a, it's a really big issue and people's own behavior can make a big difference here. Now, I'm not saying that sewer blockages are caused by climate change because they're not, but climate change puts further demands on our sewage networks and then exacerbates the problem. And we've done some work um, on consumers' attitudes in the context of uh, water efficiency back in 2017. And that showed that no matter how a consumer badged themselves, for example, if they badged themselves as an environmentalist or a, or a penny pincher, an explanation of the big picture of how climate change is impacting our weather was absolutely critical. People were far more inclined to change their behavior when the big picture was understood. And the climate change adaptation reports are a really great place to set out that big picture and, and, and the ways in which companies can help empower people to change their behaviors and their habits. Now, the next point is reassurance. And I think this is where a lot of people instantly go when you talk about adaptation reports. Ah, it's there to reassure customers. Um, and I think it is absolutely true, but it's not the only game in town here. Now, currently there's a very high degree of trust in water companies. And that's a really, really positive thing. and something that should be celebrated. Most people trust that the water company is doing the right thing and is dealing with the challenges posed by climate change. Now, the adaptation reports are, of course, a great way, a great vehicle for laying out all that's been done to manage climate change risks, to reassure people that they are, that their companies are on it, to show companies, customers, sorry, that their trust isn't misplaced. And you might be surprised to know that there is actually a desire for people to have this information. Now, yes, really, there is. And we did some more research on this last year. We talked to consumers about climate change. They, re they recognised it was the biggest uh, environmental challenge that, that we faced by far. And... And just under half the people we spoke to also thought that water companies were currently feeling the impact of climate change today. Also around two thirds of the people we spoke to said it was really important that water companies made this information available and this type of thing. So not just climate change, but wider environmental impacts too. And again, the adaptation reports provide this really good platform for doing this. 
And the third aspect I want to look at is, is perceptions. Consumers' views are really important for any business. Any business should be concerned with what their, their customers and, and, and consumers more widely think. But this is especially true in the water sector and regulated utilities where customers can't, well, particularly in water actually, because customers can't choose their supplier and they can't walk away if they don't like what the provider is doing. So it's vital that water companies do all they can to ensure that people view them in a positive light because it's essential to maintain legitimacy in a regulated monopoly, particularly in the context of a monopoly that may have to be spending money in the future, significant money to build resilience. So consumer perceptions in water industry are really important, are really positive in a number of areas that I've mentioned for, I mentioned trust earlier, but others aren't so high. You know, things like value for money and fairness of bills could be much higher. And, uh, and that's something that actually does affect people, pe people's attitudes. And the adaptation reports can really help you because one of the things customers said to us when we talked about how do you increase value for money scores is they, they were saying, well, tell, tell me how my money is spent. I have no clue where it goes. And actually, Using the adaptation reports to explain that the, the money is invested well um, can, and invested in areas that customers think are really important, like reducing climate risk, can really help change perceptions. But perceptions aren't just about bills and bill levels. It's about other things, including views on whether the company cares, uh, whether the company is viewed as profligate in their use of resources. And there's a link back to the behavior point here, because if if people are much more are less likely to change their own behaviors in their homes in terms of being water efficient if they view their water company as profligate in, in their water use. Uh, and that's why leakage can be very damaging to perceptions. Those visible leaks that run and run can have a hugely demotivating factor when it comes to personal behavior change. And again, that's why the adaptation reports can build positive perceptions by clearly articulating how much the sector is doing to be good stewards of our water resources and how they're protecting them for the future. Now, perceptions are notoriously hard to shift, and that's why companies need to take all opportunities, including these adaptation reports, to turn that dial in a positive direction. So in closing, we are very keen that the most is made out of the adaptation reporting. And this is one of the reasons why we've written to all the water companies, to give them some pointers on what the next adaptation uh, reports could look like from a consumer perspective. And we intend to keep that dialogue going and helping to bring people together, such as this event. Uh, and we want to look to share good practice and share insights more widely. And there's tremendous potential here for companies to use these reports as a communication tool with a clear purpose of communicating with consumers in mind and trying to uh, act as a turbocharge for behavior change. So it's not just about providing reassurance that climate risks are being, risk being managed, it's also about building positive perceptions and acting as that catalyst for behavior change. It can make a real impact in our sort of journey to adapting to climate change. So if we're, serious to adapt to, if we're serious about adapting to climate change, then we're gonna get serious about understanding the role consumers can play. So that's all I'm gonna say for the moment. So thank you very much. That's great. Thanks ever so much, Mike. And a really good reminder of how important it is that we uh, we understand people's perceptions and then we get that consumer and public view on, on all the things that uh, need to be done. Um, I can see some questions are coming through on Slido, and quite a few, in fact, and also some answers being generated as well. So that, that's great. Please keep that coming. We're now going to move to our final speaker in this session, uh, who is Francis Pimenta from DEFRA. Uh, Francis leads DEFRA's climate adaptation policy team responsible for delivering duties in the Climate Change Act of 2008 on preparing for climate change. This includes implementation of the National Adaptation Programme, working with action owners across government, public agencies and in wider society to ensure actions and objectives are achieved. More broadly, the adaptation team is involved in promoting adaptation within government to ensure that consideration of climate risks is embedded in policy making. Francis, over to you. Thank you very much, Terry, and apologies, I was just struggling with my technology a bit there. All good. Um, thank you very much. And I'm Frances Pimenta, as Terry mentioned, and I work in DEFRA's adaptation team. It is a pleasure to be here speaking today about adaptation reporting power and just how important it is for us and our such true framework overall. 
I think this is a really timely opportunity to have this conversation today as we enter that last phase of the Adaptation Reporting Power third cycle, which, as has been mentioned, ends at the end of this year. So I just wanted to kick off by, by framing ARP in terms of our statutory framework, so the Climate Change Act 2008. And of course, the, the first pillar of that framework is our climate change risk assessment, which is required every five years. The second pillar of that is the National Adaptation Programme, so that's our programme to address the risks highlighted in the CCRA. And we're currently in the second uh, National Adaptation Programme midway through delivery, and that will complete in 2023. ARP is our third pillar, and it is, of course, the power that our Secretary of State has to invite or direct relevant organisations to report on their plans to manage climate change risk. Um, I don't think I really need to go into this, but ARP covers a wide range of organisations from infrastructure providers, regulators, public bodies, and across sectors such as water, energy, transport, the environment, heritage, health, and finance, amongst others. So DEFRA, where I work, is the coordinating department, but of course, responsibility for delivering actions, making change, and addressing risks sits across government public sector business and wider society. So we all have a very important role to play. And as uh, Chris and others have mentioned today, we have a strong decade of, uh, have a strong decade of this um, statutory framework in place, but there's a lot more to do. Uh, and clearly we need to get real about those risks posed by the two and even four degree levels of warming that we may have to confront. So to put ARP back into that context, ARP was the first step of our statutory cycle that, that actually was enacted back in 2009. It kicked everything off. Um, and since then, we've had two, two rounds. Now in our third, we've had a, a mixture of different mandatory and voluntary rounds uh, in the past. Uh, these have been informed by, by consultations and, and obviously our ministerial steer. Uh, and we've had some good evaluations. Something that is quite interesting from our perspective as we enter this third round or as we enter the end of the third round is just, I think, what something I've felt is just how much climate has risen up the agenda and just the level of interest that we are getting and, and inquiries we get about ARP. And indeed, it's the part of our statutory framework that I get the most questions about from counterparts and governments across the world. So I think it is definitely a, a, a hugely important part of our armory and, and actually a, a very innovative and interesting a, a part of our approach. Um, I think in terms of ARP3, it is technically a voluntary round. However, the key difference here is that um, it is described as a hybrid approach. So it, whilst it is uh, uh, by invitation, um, it has a stronger role for DEFRA in supporting organizations to promote consistent high quality reports in convening. We provide a, a kind of frequently asked questions set of guidance. We support uh, sexual conversations around templates for reporting and we have that that kind of stronger role uh, compared to the second round uh, and we're very excited by the large number of organizations reporting so it's feel, been a positive experience so far if you'd like to find out a bit more about previous reports they are all available on gov.uk so we've got that transparent portal to to read more about it we also publish a list of reporting organizations in the third round there on gov.uk as well. In terms of the principles for ARP, I've gone into this a little bit, but it is very much framed around uh, primarily supporting the ongoing integration of climate change risk management into organisations' work. So it is there to benefit the organisations reporting, um, as has been mentioned, um, but it has a secondary role as well as informing government, the CCCs and the wider public understanding on the level of preparedness across key sectors. So it has this really important dual function. Um, and as, as I've mentioned, this for this third round, we've really looked at the question of consistency and quality and support for those sectoral approaches, those common sectoral approaches to reporting to ensure high quality content and consistency and approach. Um, I think with this third round where we've really been looking to see that maturity of approach and building on the good foundations of previous reports. There's a lot organizations will have learned in the 
in the the period in between. And was, there's also been a lot of developments in terms of the science. We've heard about UK CP18 projections. I think since the last report ended in 2015, we've broken just about every weather record. So there's a lot to take stock of, I think, as organizations think about this for their third round of reporting. So in terms of DEFRA's offer, we've, uh, we've been convening sectoral conversations and working with uh, reporting organizations. And just about this time last year, we hosted a workshop uh, with the, all, all the range of reporting organizations in DEFRA uh, and, and had a deeper discussion on what some of the, the key issues to think about in the third reporting round should be. So that covered the, the topic of interdependencies in particular. We also spoke about climate projections and the role of pro promoting and sharing best practice. So organizations shared some of their takeaways on, on how to make the most of the process as well. I've summarized them on the slides there, um, but there's, I think, a lot, a lot around this concept of, of common approaches and sectoral conversations. ARP has also helped um, foster a number of conversations around common approaches to decision making uh, and just reflecting that uh, DEFRA has been part of conversations with the water sector and transport sector bodies around how to how to grapple with the question of, of scenarios and which scenarios to use and whether we can converge around those in our planning approaches. Coming towards the end, uh, in terms of next steps and milestones, this is a hugely important year for adaptation, not just obviously because the UK is hosting COP26 and adaptation and resilience are one of our top themes for that. Um, but for in terms of our domestic framework, we've got some big uh, milestones coming up. So on this timeline, you'll see that we've got a progress report in June. So the CCC's uh, two yearly progress report comes out then. And we've also got an evidence report that will inform our third climate change risk evidence report as well. And so that government response will come out in January next year. So there's everything to play for. Our ARP3 reports, I think, will provide that excellent benchmark for just how far we've come in that decade since uh, the Climate Change Act came into, into place. Um, ARP very much feeds into those statutory processes and informs our reporting and, and general overall intelligence on the state of adaptation in the country. So it cannot be un overstated just how important it is. Um, and just to kind of end on a, on a positive note, we've definitely seen and, and felt uh, in DEFRA just how much adaptation has been rising up the agenda. Um, we've recently had some, some big moments uh, with the UK publishing its first adaptation communication to the UN, the UNCCC, in December at the Climate Ambition Summit alongside our NDC commitment on emissions reduction. And we've recently had the Prime Minister addressing the Virtual Climate Adaptation Summit in January. And indeed yesterday he addressed the UN on the topic of climate security and, and impacts in that sense. So it is a hugely important moment and I just wanted to, to end on the note of thanking all the reporting organizations for their continued commitment and leadership in, in reporting. I hope that this process continues to be uh, as useful for you in galvanizing action within your organizations and in your sectors in showcasing best practice, as Chris said, in really getting real about the huge challenges we face. But I hope it is as useful for you in, in that sense as it is for us in DEFRA. And so, a big thank you from us. I'm really looking forward to receiving the reports um, as they come in throughout the rest of the year and looking forward to presentations later today. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Francis, and thank you to all of our speakers this morning. Um, if you could perhaps come back on to, to camera, please, our, our panellists, we're going to move straight into some questions. There's some great ones. Um, in fact, I'm just going to go to um, one of one of the top or a couple of the top rated questions here, which uh, some of you have touched upon in your presentations around the mandatory or, or not non mandatory nature of of reporting. So uh, a question we have here is um, should reporting be mandatory and if so, for who and why would it be useful? And I think the related, a related question here also is around the role of the task force uh, for climate related disclosure and, and whether that's a, a, a useful sort of channel and tool to um, encourage reporting. So 
Um, I'll open it up to all of the panel, please, to, to respond. Who, who would like to, to go first? I could take that one, Terry. I, mean, I mentioned it. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yes, I think it should be mandatory, and uh, that's a long-standing position of the CCC. Uh, we've made that point several times to uh, DEFRA ministers. Uh, and the importance of that is that I mean, we've kind of lost, I'm afraid, the momentum that we got through the first round of reporting into the second. And now the, I mean, I'm sure the third reports will be better, but it would have been better if we'd been consistent in uh, you know, the need to, to produce these reports throughout the, uh, the last, uh, last 12 years. So that idea of being mandatory, mandatory is not a good word, is it? It sounds very, it sounds negative. But uh, the point about this is that with, with mandatory reporting comes more consistent reporting and, and augmenting and improvements over time come with that too. So that's the, that's the key thing is that we, we do see these gaps in the reporting now, sadly, that have come uh, and some of the organisations that uh, reported in the first round didn't report in the second round. Uh, and we're kind of making up for lost ground, I'm afraid, on that. And I'm afraid we're not going to get to the outcome that we all seek until we return to um, uh, mandatory reporting, sadly. Uh, and for me, that, that the other point I would, I would accompany with that is that it is possible to do this in a strategic way so that it doesn't become a huge burden. Uh, I made that point in my, um, in my, in my talk. Uh, and in any case, the, 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 the reporting has benefits, not just to the, to the state, to the government and to citizens here, but also to the reporting organisations. So it needn't be as, this burden that it's sometimes framed up as if, um, if it reveals those kind of benefits to the organisation as well. So, yeah, I do think we need mandatory reporting. We'll be, be in a better place at the end of it. Yes, thank you. Sorry, can I just chip in there? Is that is that okay? Um, okay, Mike. Sorry, yes. yeah, just on the mandatory reporting, we've, we've long been supporters of making it mandatory. Um, it's bizarre in the water sector that you have, they have well, some water companies, this is true, this isn't just made up, some water companies will have all of their business plans they submit to offer that climate change is our number one thing, they've got to spend all this money on adapting, and then they'll go, nah, we can't be bothered reporting because, you know, uh, it's, it's not seen as important enough. You go, well, it can't be both, you know, so I think we just need to, I mean, the phrase that Chris used earlier in a different context was get real. I mean, companies need to get real. It's either important or it's not. And if it's important, then make the most of the reporting. Absolutely. The enlightened businesses that I talk to um, see the benefit of, of the reporting um, directly to their business, the sustainability of it and, and things like shareholder value as well. You know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's pretty clear examples out there, I think. Um, Stephen, you wanted to come in as well, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Terry. I, I don't have a, a view on whether it should be mandatory or not, but um, Chris and Mike have both mentioned the co-benefits of doing this, and it just seems like a basic stress test of the business, particularly utilities business, that has such broad exposure to, to weather and climate hazards. It, it feels like good practice. Uh, the tools, as I think all of the presentations this morning have demonstrated, are there for an analytical approach. Um, so it, it feels like this is the right time for folk to be having a, having a good go at this, to me. Yes, thank you, Stephen. As Gary, as it might be worth talking about TCFD as well at this moment. I don't know whether that's something... Uh, yes, yes, I, I, yes, there was a related question around the, um, the task force for um, climate-related disclosure and whether that um, is a... Um, a, uh, um, a driving you know, factor for, for us. Um, can I just go to Francis perhaps on the previous question, then we'll come course, to you sorry, on, on that. No, thank you. Francis, would you like That's, I, I think um, just kind of echoing what, what Stephen said, there's, there's definitely that benefit to reporting. And I think that's really come through strongly in this round, even though um, technically organizations were reported, invited to, to report. Uh, and the numbers in terms of those who've committed, in, in fact, are not that much lower to um, than that kind of initial um, mandatory round. So I think that's the real kind of takeaway positive for me. We're heading in that direction. Organisations are recognising the need to take this really seriously. So I think that's kind of where, where things are. And as Chris mentioned, we've got other things looming now with TCFD. And I think organisations one way or another will recognise that this is something that needs to be um, captured and reported on and, and the key part of business as usual operations in, in our big organizations and, and indeed every, all organizations. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so we, yes, TCFD has been mentioned. The question is, will it help to drive reporting and therefore action by non 
ARP members and TCFD is the task force for climate related disclosures. Um, would you like to comment on that, Chris? Yeah, I was going to make the point that uh, Francis from uh, Francis Health from Atkins has just made in the in the uh, in the in Slido questions that there is uh, a lot to be gained from trying to integrate the um, uh, the financial disclosure uh, requirements of TCFD with um, with the with the adaptation reporting requirements. Now they're not quite the same thing, but the the hope has to be surely that through a combination of uh, the adaptation reporting and and the the soon to be mandatory TCFD rules. Uh, we're going to raise the issue of of looking at, at climate change in the round to the level of the boardroom, which is where it really needs to be. Um, and uh, TCFD is a it's a it's a very complicated thing, and it's, it trips off the tongue, doesn't it? Tra Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, but but in reality, it, if you peer through that, what we're looking at is the exposure of a of a business to the two risks for climate change. One is the the physical risk of climate change, which is what we're dealing with today, and the other one, which is worth dwelling on, is the the exposure to um, you know, the, the, the transition to net zero, which um, many corporates are not ready for too. Now, both of those issues need to be tackled. They are real climate issues. And I, I have to say that raising it in, in that way through these disclosure rules is I think probably more important than many of the climate policies that ministers will be able to put in place over the course of the next 10 years. And it has a, a, you know, a really deep implication for um, the progress that we'll need to make over the course of, of, of the next uh, few decades. So I'm very excited about it. I, and I really wanted just to make the point that we should be bringing these things together as much as possible. Yeah, thank you. OK, look, we're very rich on questions and very poor on time at the moment. So I'm going to um, move on um, to uh, actually the top rated question that we've had so far this morning. And uh, this is one that will chime with Cywem's Director of Policy, who uh, is heard to, to say that uh, adaptation is the poor relation of, of mitigation in terms of, of climate, uh, addressing climate change. Um, and so the question is, what needs to change to make adaptation more visible? Who would like to address that first? Yes, yes, please, Stephen. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sure others will have a view on this. The, the mitigation target is very straightforward, right? Net zero. It's very easy to state, probably rather hard to get to, and charting a path to that is difficult. Um, what good adaptation looks like is much harder to define, maybe. Um, but as, as we discussed this morning, it, it's really the richness of, of this that makes it so compelling and so important to really embrace properly because it, it's part of how we in any of our operations, and I would include the Met Office in this, are going to perform both now in a resilient way, but also in the future in a resilient way. So it's part of that resilience building um, thing that any any business um, would want to go to through I would think um, how to make it more visible specifically um, I think the climate change commission do a great job in in driving this drool track and and I think there's more that uh, the rest of the community can do to just make sure these things remain part of the same sentence so the catchphrase I would advocate is we talk about a pathway to net zero how about a pathway to a resilient net zero and let's talk about the word resilience a little bit more yeah, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Mike, yes, please. Yeah, I mean, I think we can also work harder to capture the attention of the public when it comes to adaptation. So, for example, people love seeing infrastructure and like seeing images of big things, impressive things. You know, Thames has done a really good job recently on showing images of the fatberg that they cleared out, um, whilst that isn't going to change adaptation. But people do like seeing you know, pictures of infrastructure. And actually, it's not just about showing what they are doing, although what that actually can help capture the imagination. It's also about getting people involved in the projects themselves, because look, it's a kind of like um, consumer body Tourette's to say, oh, you should, consumers should be engaged in everything. They absolutely shouldn't be involved in everything. They should be involved in things they can have a meaningful say in. But do you know what? There's loads of big infrastructure where there's still meaningful choices where communities can get involved to actually influence. And that way you can really connect to people. And do you know what? That presents huge opportunities to then say, actually, have you thought about doing this water efficient stuff in your home? Have you thought about what you chucked in your toilet in terms of sewer misuse? So actually that wider community engagement um, is really important. There's been some really good work done in the water sector, but there's tons of untapped potential here. 
Yeah, thank you, Mike. OK, we could talk on, on about that, but I'm going to try and squeeze in one last question very quickly and just ask for a soundbite answer from, from each of you, if that's at all possible. And the question is, has anything changed since the CCC's review of the second round of reporting? Or rather, what has changed? Perhaps you could answer it that way as well. So just quick sort of one word, to, to, one sentence answers, please, from each of you, if I can. Um, Mike, go for you first. I'll come to you, Chris, then. Not enough. <laughs> Chris? Yeah, we've got better at assessing. So that's one thing that's got that's uh, that's improved. And, um, and I think there is a general much, much higher awareness of the issues, uh, which I think is helped by the net zero stuff. Uh, but of course, we've got to move on from that into the, I firmly agree with what, what, what Stephen and, and Mike said in their, in their last replies. So, so not enough is a very good answer to that question, but mm. we're in a better place to improve things than we were at CCRA too. That's a really good and hopeful thought. Uh, anything else to add at all from you, Stephen or Francis? No pressure. I think <laughs> the, C the CCC's review provided some really helpful stairs for the third uh, adaptation strategy in terms of big questions of interdependencies on use of evidence. Uh, as well as, as sectoral led conversations. So I think all of those things have been uh, really crucial areas of progress from what I've seen so far of this round. Mm, well um, so, so good and more to go. Yeah, well said, thank you very much. Stephen, you get the last word if you want it. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I have anything very profound to say other than that this event is, is really, I hope gonna galvanize some thinking around this and it's been great to be on a panel with such a rounded range of views. Yeah, thank you. And that's what I would say, actually, it's, it's great to be on such a well attended event and we are at least having this discourse that surely is, is progress. OK, right. Look, thank you ever so much to all of our, our speakers this morning um, for that um, and the quick fire questions. Um, we will be capturing these questions. They won't get lost and we're going to help to sort of use them in the, um, the output from today's event. But uh, that's all we've got time for at the moment. We're going to have a five minute break now. So I'll make that 10.36, please, just to kind of stretch your legs and, and we'll get started with them um, with part two. OK, see you then. Thank you.
Hello and uh, welcome back everybody. I uh, hope you had an opportunity there to stretch your legs and maybe even boil a kettle if you were lucky. Um, we're now going to move on with the, the second part of, of our webinar and this session will be a bit different from the first. Um, we've got six experienced reporters from different sectors, from regulators, finance, water and infrastructure. And we're going to give them each three minutes to impart their wisdom on how to get the most out of the ARP process, how submissions can be used to prioritise adaptation and how it's been used to mobilise change within organisations. And after all have spoken, we will go to your questions to them. So please do get slidoing during these three minute slots. It should be quite frantic, but let's get lots of questions coming in, please. Um, and we'll put them to the panel at the end of the session. So first up, we have Kay Johnston from the Environment Agency. I'm really hoping that you're there, Claire, somewhere. Yes, you are. OK, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Terry. Um, yeah, so, so much has changed since we first did our uh, ARP first report back in 2011, both in terms of the public and political discourse on climate change in general, and also developments in evidence and practitioner experience on adaptation. And the preparation of our third report now comes at a time when uh, the global response to the coronavirus crisis has demonstrated a really pressing need to work together on um, to share solutions to overcome global uncertainty. COP26 hosted this year of course is starting to shine a light on progress that we're making in this country on climate change. Um, and the Environment Agency manages risks on behalf of the country through our roles as regulator, advisor, operator, flood and other assets. And as such we operate within quite specific policy and legal frameworks and our report can't be abstracted from these. And these have also matured in recent years with respect to their um, treatment of climate change adaptation, allowing us to further embed climate considerations into our work. And our internal capacity and understanding and ambition has also developed. We now have a climate change programme at the Environment Agency, which coordinates cross-cutting action and strategy and supported by extremely strong leadership, both from the chief executive and the chair who was appointed as UK commissioner to the Global Commission on Adaptation. And our ambition is reflected in our corporate strategy, the 25 year environment plan and a flood strategy, which has climate change both as a top priority and also as a visible thread throughout. So our third report will put more emphasis on long term adaptation strategy. It will set out how we are preparing for the full range of climate futures, including some high-end scenario, how we are embedding actions against uh, across the organisation, and how we are planning ahead for areas where a, a step change or more transformational adaptation is required. In our third report, we are building on the risk-based approach that we took previously, but we've also introduced the concept of urgency to our scoring methodology alongside the familiar severity and magnitude assessment. So this is looking at the time needed to respond versus the time that we have to respond in order that longer term risks um, that are still urgent are not deprioritized. So we're hoping to produce a report that will resonate across the organisation and externally, showcasing our ambitions for tackling some of the country's biggest climate risks and setting out our strategic direction on adaptation. We're planning to be quite open and honest about where uh, the future might hold limits to current approaches and limits to what we can do alone so that we can use the report as a means of challenging both ourselves and others in support of bold action. Great, thank you very much Kay. Um, uh, moving straight on now to uh, David Quincy from Network Rail. David from uh, Network Rail, are you there? Right, I think we may have lost, uh, no, David's back. David, can you hear us and can we hear you? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, in a truly resilient fashion. Uh, my phone is ringing out there. There's people shredding a tree outside my window that I don't know if you can hear, and I've just got kicked out. So let's just go with this, show. Timing is everything, isn't it? 
Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so I uh, have been involved in adaptation reporting twice before, but not with Network Rail. Um, so this has been my first time with them. Um, so we, I've got some thoughts looking back at, at what they did last time um, and where we're going to go this time around. So adaptation reporting is seen as important to Network Rail as, as key. Um, it's seen as a way, as, as a basic minimum, of, 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 an, of a, a, <clears throat> an opportunity to refresh our view of our risks, uh, look back on what we'd thought we, we'd got as risk before, see what's changed in the way of science and, and our understanding and, 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 and how awareness when the business has changed it. Uh, it again, as a basic, it, it's an ability to summarise uh, our position, where we are, where we've been, where we're going. Um, Historically, uh, looking back at the previous two iterations, um, they had a lot of detailed weather uh, stuff in them and, a, and an understanding of climate risk, but they, they were very much done from a centre of network rail uh, approach and didn't really have a lot of connection to what's happening out of the coal face on, out on the routes and regions. So that's a, a big change that we're going to see uh, this time around, but we're going to have a much more holistic approach. We've done a lot of work on understanding our level of risk and a lot of work uh, on understanding both the weather and climate linkages in that risk. Um, we've republished our root uh, racker plans as we call them, weather resilience and climate change adaptation plans, so they will form a key backbone to the inputs of this. We have just completed uh, an asset function risk assessment so for the first time, uh, looking at all of our internal central asset functions and how they relate to the roots and those root racker plans. And understanding sort of where those risks lie and where we need to take them and enter an action plan. So again, that will form a backbone. There's a lot of extra work to go in on this, and hopefully it'll be a lot more in the way of action plan this time rather than just risk uh, and weather action. Um, it's also being used as part of developing our overarching strategy and plan, which will align with our new environmental sustainability strategy. So again, that's a key alignment with our, our key business targets. Um, so again, there will be a, a much more tie into to the end-to-end -end delivery of those. Um, and it, it, it's, its biggest benefit to us has been engagement. Um, it's allowed us to engage with the individual parts of the business. And when we're a big organization like this, it, it can feel quite remote from, from the top of the center to, to someone on, on the coalface on the track. So involving the roots of developing their own plans and making those plans a central part of this process has involved by its very nature a lot of talking a lot of interaction a lot of understanding um it's happened in the light of the tragic events that happened up in scotland um so it's uh, an ill wind but it's a timely reminder of the need for for the importance of resilience and uh, it's put a lot of focus on to the review of, of where we are where we're going. It, it's opened doors. Uh, there have been two big task forces created as a result of it to look at how we respond to weather and how particularly earthworks respond to that and future weather. Um, it will um, allow us to develop greater integration into our CP7 on its control planning, uh, planning which, is, which is being driven through. And again, that will be reported in this report. Um, it's, it's focusing our attention on investment plans this time around. Uh, we're obviously aware in COVID, we're in an interesting funding situation where a railway is being funded more by the taxpayers than the passengers on it at the moment. Um, and we need to think about how to build back better. So resilience is a key part to play in that, not just to the weather and climate, to the economy. So it's, it's all becoming a very holistic viewpoint. Um, I think it's good to note that it's much more on the radar of our exec and board um, and they'll be more involved in the sign off this time um, and I think it, it really gives us a platform to uh, identify the gaps we need to address over the next five years before the next one assuming it is five years as previously mentioned and whether it's mandatory or not and we're now into the position where we're into that long game because we've spent a lot of time understanding our risks. We're now moving into the delivery and our plan is to, is to see a resilient railway over the next 20, 30, 40 years to allow for appropriate staged investment. And as part of that, and as part of this ARP, we will actually be attempting to develop with the routes and regions um, 
the climate adaptation pathways approach. So again, this should all come through in, in this ARP. We haven't in the past done a lot of work on interdependencies. Um, so this opportunity will be taken as part of writing this as well. So my, my hope is that, that basically all the good stuff that the ARP gives you, which is the collaboration, it's the, it's the reminding people of the importance, it's the gathering information, it's the summary, it's the understanding and the ability to identify gaps and address them. All that will, will follow through into this one, but, but hopefully we will learn with a, um, an actual action plan and we'll end up with it tying much more to the frontline parts of the business than it did in the past. Um, I think really that's probably a bit of a, a ramble, but it, it's sort of, um, it's our stream of consciousness on the reporting, I think. David, uh, not a ramble at all. That was um, very clear and very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, okay, um, I can see some really cracking questions coming in on, on Slido. Please keep them uh, coming. Um, we're going to move on now to our next speaker, who is James Rowe from the Bank of England. Uh, James, I am saying you don't have a camera, but I'm hoping you have a microphone. So over to you. Oh, I do. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so a quick couple of minutes then on, on, on PRA. Uh, in April 2014, the PRA accepted an invitation from DEFRA to complete a climate change adaptation report focused on the UK insurance sector. The result in an 87 page report was the PRA's response and also the PRA's first report on the subject of climate change. The report's objective was to provide a framework to consider the risks arising from climate change through the lens of the PRA statutory objectives in relation to insurers, i.e. the safety and soundness of firms and the appropriate policy protection for policyholders. The report took the form of initial risk assessment. It explored possible responses to the risks identified, but was not intended to provide a policy prescription. The report also discussed opportunities for the UK insurance industry as a result of climate change. Regarding inclusion of climate change science, the report sought to reflect evidence provided by respected authorities, particularly the IPCC. The PRA's areas of judgment in the report were focused on the relevance of scientific evidence to regulated firms and to the PRA's objectives. As you're probably aware, insurance is a market-based mechanism for the transfer of risk. PRA's role through its objectives is to contribute to ensuring that the risk transfer can occur in a reliable and effective way throughout the UK insurance sector. As you're probably aware, the report identified three primary channels or risk factors through which impacts from climate change might be expected to arise. First of those was physical risks, i.e. the first order of risks that arise from weather-related events, such as floods, hurricanes and storms, and these effects the report determined could be direct or indirect. Secondly, transition risks. These relate to the financial risks which could arise for insurance firms in the transition to a lower carbon economy. For insurance firms, the risk factor is mainly about the potential repricing of carbon-intensive financial assets and the speed at which any such repricing might occur. Liability risks with a third uh, risk considered, and risks that could arise for insurance firms from parties who have suffered loss and damage from climate change and then seek to recover losses from others who they believe may have been responsible. For each of these factors, the report explored the nature of the risk, the possible impacts on insurance firms' balance sheet, and the action firms could take to mitigate them. The clearest risk identified in the report was from physical risk. Only most of the report is focused on that aspect. At the time of writing, understanding of the other two risk categories was less well developed and more uncertain. Nonetheless, the report anticipated that it could have a meaningful impact on the PRA's objectives over time. Across these risk factors, the PRA's analysis suggested the potential for climate change to present a substantial challenge to the business model of insurers. In particular, the report highlighted that it was possible that climate change will reduce or eliminate the sector's appetite to provide insurance cover for specific sets of activities, assets, or customers. And this is relevant to the PRA's objectives and was highlighted in it as an area of interest for other policymakers. In terms of preparing the report, the PRA participated in four roundtable discussions, which were fundamental in helping to determine the content of the report. These were each attended by up to 30 participants, including at least 10 different insurance firms. The report provided a number of conclusions in relation to the risks identified, of which I'll highlight just one here now. Climate change, quote, sorry, climate change is becoming increasingly relevant to financial regulation. The PRA's approach will focus on promoting resilience to climate change and supporting an orderly financial sector transition to lower carbon economy. The PRA will do this through a combination of international collaboration, research, dialogue and supervision. On that last sentence, in the intervening five years, our approach continues to focus on these priorities. The report helps to drive forward these priorities and, fo and our focus as a central bank and regulator 
which will be fully reflected in our next report. Thank you. James, thank you very much indeed for, for that. Um, I understand, sadly, you can't uh, join us for the question session uh, later, but um, I, um, I trust that we'll be able to kind of reach out to you as we put together the, um, the output from today's uh, web webinar, um, if any sort of specific questions do come in. Absolutely, apologies for that. And, and yeah, absolutely, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll speak again in the future. That's lovely, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, we're now moving on to um, Hannah Armitage from the Financial Reporting Council. Hannah, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me today. I'm coming, as Terry said, from the Financial Reporting Council. Now, we're an organisation that many of you may not have heard of. We're the regulators of accountants, auditors and actuaries within the United Kingdom. So last year, we did a project looking at a range of... Uh, a range of entities within the reporting and investment chain. So we looked at how um, the governance of companies, company annual reports, audit activity, professional associations and investors are taking account of climate related considerations. As part of that report, we found that there was some interesting practice, but that more needs to be done. So we will be coming up later this year to do our first climate adaptation report. So I apologize that I don't have the, um, the history that some people have about what they've done in the past. But what we learned from our report last year is going to enable us to put forward some thoughts across a range of real economy businesses and also the investment, the investment chain as we make some, um, some reflections on adaptation issues. As I said, we're in the first round of climate adaptation reporting, so very much at the start of the process, and our regulatory remit is a bit different to some of those other regulators on this call. But we are going to be looking to consider as part of our climate adaptation report how, through their reporting, companies are demonstrating that they're taking account of climate-related considerations, including adaptation, how auditors are doing so, and what we can expect of investors and others throughout the investment chain as we aim for um, a, a, consideration, a better consideration of adaptation. We're going to be focusing on our ability to influence and encourage the direction of change as we talk about what that reporting might look like. And we're also hoping that alongside some of the other regulators who work more in the financial space, so Bank of England and PRA, the pensions regulator and the FCA, that we might be able to coordinate to come out with some quite key messages about what the risks are, that, what the risks are that we face in the um, financial arena and uh, how we're all viewing those and, and what that means for our individual remits. It's very happy to take any questions on that in the Q&A session and I look forward to hearing others tips of how they've done climate adaptation reporting. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Hannah. It's really good to get uh, the financial perspective into, into this debate. Thanks very much. Okay, we're going to move on now to uh, Daniel Johns, who is a SIWEM fellow and works for Anglian Water, who are a SIWEM business partner. So um, we're doing lots of uh, good things together at the moment. Uh, Daniel, it's really good to hear what you have to say on this particular topic. Over to you. Thanks very much, Terry. And I've got uh, the pleasure of presenting at Anglian Water's third adaptation report, which we published in December 2020, having consulted on an early draft last March. Obviously, we wanted to, you know, given what Chris Stark was saying earlier on this morning, we wanted to bring our adaptation report out and get it published, get it consulted on uh, well in advance of the third climate change risk assessment so that our, our results and the progress that we've made can be fully factored into that, that assessment. And as a, as a water company serving the east of England, climate change, climate change adaptation, of course, is incredibly important to us. What carbon is to net zero, I would argue water is to climate change adaptation. Uh, this is the driest part of the country. It's the flattest part of the country. So we are managing the risks of uh, water supply shortages on a daily basis, managing risks of flooding, uh, absolutely at the moment, sea level rise, the long eroding coastline. So all these risks, they were given the population growth and environmental uh, degradation very much front and center of our climate change adaptation uh, report um, just obviously i can't do it justice in the three minutes that i've got but just to kind of encourage you to go to our website uh, to take a look at the report uh, together with the summary that we published alongside it in december so we've got a nice neat summary for customers anybody else who wants to dip in for five minutes and take a look uh, having reviewed uh, from from the kind of ground up uh, 40 plus risks that we manage uh, measure as part of the corporate risk register we highlighted these four headline risks on the left hand side these kind of physical risks to the business from water supply if two related to flooding 
and one relates to the natural capital, the kind of the quality of the ecology within our triple SIs in particular. So looking at the physical risks on the left-hand side, we also took a, took a look at the transition risk business, so those financial risks, the business uh, that we face in uh, moving to a net zero economy, and, and in particular to becoming a net zero business by 2030, as we have committed to do. But we also looked at independencies and also on, in a cross-cutting way, looking at our customers and the risks of extreme weather events to our customers looking at, in each of these cases at the existing risk, uh, what the risk would be if we took no action. And of course, where we want to get to both in 2025 and in the longer term to 2045. Uh, again, I'll just skip through the next slide, but essentially we try to make the report as, as visual, as kind of uh, engaging as possible and pack, packing it as far as possible with, with all manner of evidence, thinking about the scale of the risk of business, plus also the impact of ac actions that we are taking. Uh, together with a whole range of case studies, uh, just taking examples of how we are managing adaptation risk on the ground, including taking this place-based approach to the FENS, which is, uh, is at a risk of a range of different impacts from climate change, and trying to come up with a kind of place-based integrated adaptation plan, which also thinks about the long-term economic development opportunities that there are within that region. But first and foremost, as you know, given my previous role was at the Committee on Climate Change, where my team literally wrote the book on what a good adaptation report should look like. Uh, what was really driving both me personally and the team was trying to make sure that we got some good feedback from the CCC and that uh, we got out earlier, say, with our report to make sure that it fed into CC83. But also we tried to set a bar very high in terms of what a good report should look like. So thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I think within your um, boundary, you have a, a fascinating um, range of, of issues and, uh, and to, uh, to consider. And I'm sure there are days where you might find a different adjective to describe it. But uh, I think it's a really interesting mix of things that you're, you're looking to address. So thanks very much to you, Daniel. We're now going to move on to our, our final speaker, who is uh, Howard Perry from Seven Trent Water. Good morning, hopefully you can see me and thank you very much. So my name is Howard Perry, I am the energy manager at Seven Trent Water, so we cover the Midlands and into Wales, um, very similar to remit to Anglian for our own region. And I particularly lead our carbon reduction strategy to meet our net zero operational greenhouse gas by 2030 goal. Um, and I also lead our reporting on climate change. And it's worth remembering that every year we report to the CDP and elsewhere on climate change, on carbon and on climate change risks as well. So that there is potentially more out there in the public domain than, than people realise sometimes. I also did a lot of work um, with Mike, as he's mentioned, back in 2015 on our previous adaptation report. So that was published September 2015 and still well worth a read. So if you Google Seven Trent Adaptation, you will find that the risks and the actions that we've laid out there are still um, remarkably current and up to date. It's not been uh, proven uh, problematic in, in any respect so far. So it's well worth a read and, and a reflect. Um, it is worth, though, I think, um, reflecting on the way in which COVID has given us some lessons to learn on adaptation. Um, and it's interesting that's not been mentioned um, so far. Um, it, it's a good example, I think, if you look at the government's pre-pandemic planning documents, there were some very well thought out risk assessments there um, that showed that the risk was foreseen and it was pretty well sketched out as well. But the policies that were recommended were the absolute opposite in some cases of what actually came to pass. So there's a real lesson there in, in adaptation planning, I think, of you can understand the risk centrally, you can plan for what you think is a sensible response. But in the event of when these things materialise, you may very well see something radically different. So the uh, the point from the Met Office speaker earlier on was, was very important. We need to think about some those fringe risks that might not necessarily be on our existing radar and really stress test and think through what would responses be if certain risks came to pass. So really useful lesson for us there. Um, in the last report, we outlined some of the major risks um, and there's three key things that I just wanted to highlight that have changed really since, um, since 2015. The first one is we've had a number of, of experiences of, of really severe weather events, and many of those were exactly of the sort that we highlighted in that report. So, for example, rising customer demand due to hot weather was our number one risk and is a risk that we've seen in practice. So particularly the hot summer of 2018, um, we saw record high water demand in the summer that we've just had 2020. We saw record high water demand 
as well. And what's been really encouraging, I think, is there's been some organic adaptation to those events that really help us to respond. So as an example, off the back of the 2018 events, we really strengthened our network response team. And we also targeted our customer communications in a much more specific way to some of the regions that we know suffer um, when there is hot weather. So there's some real organic um, adaptation and learning that's gone on from real weather events that we've had. I think the second thing to um, point out is that we've had some real context change and a number of speakers have, have mentioned this already. So, for example, the um, investor community is certainly asking us much more about climate change risks and how we cope with them. Um, we've seen more pressure from our internal executive team as well to understand climate risks and make sure that we're declaring those. And also from our regulator and off in particular, we've mentioned resilience and climate change being key components of the next price review cycle. So that gives us a real golden opportunity to build something better in the next adaptation report and also make sure that it's properly reflected in the investment plans that we put forward. The, the final point I'll make is that we've also completed a lot of the actions that we set out in that 2015 report. So the Birmingham Resilience Scheme is, is a good example of a major investment that was set out there and we have completed it. So we've done a lot of the actions that we said we would do. And I think really important in adaptation cycles is that plan and do and then check have you done what you said you would do and has the risk materially changed and getting into that continual plan do check act cycle will be the way to best practice adaptation reporting in the future, I think. Thanks. That's smashing, Howard. Thank you very much. OK, if um, all of our uh, speakers, please come back on on camera. Well, we're going to move now into we've got about 25 minutes uh, available for some questions. And, uh, and I'm glad we've got that amount of time because there's some really great questions coming through. Uh, many of which I think are going to allow you to expand a little bit on some of the things you've already told us. Um, having said that, please don't feel obliged to answer every single question. Uh, it'd be good to try and get through um, as many of these as we can. So um, if you, you don't uh, don't feel obliged to try and be additive to things if, um, if it's not, um, not necessary. OK, all right. I'm going to go straight to the top question, actually, because I think it's really going to help us to sort of tease out some um, uh, aspects of how we can accelerate progress. And the question comes from uh, Peter Von Laney from Jacobs, and he asks, um, what have you found to be the biggest barriers uh, that you face uh, in uh, effective adaptation planning? So this is the blockers and barriers. Who'd like to lead off with that? Yeah, to you, I have to go yes, first. Yeah, so um, obviously we've just been through one price review process. Uh, and in fact, for Anglo Water and three other companies, we are still in the midst of it. And one of the reasons why we rejected our final determination from Offward was because it cut back our business plan by almost three quarters of a billion pounds on projects that we see as absolutely vital to secure the long-term resilience of our water and water resource, uh, water recycling services to customers. Uh, and so climate change adaptation is, say, the grounds upon which we rejected our determination uh, and as one of all, one of four companies to appeal to the CMA. So funding is absolutely a problem. And one of the uh, constant challenges we have is trying to counter the arguments that say the best answer for customers is to reduce bills in the short term, not think about what's the, the best long-term value adding uh, investments that as a company we need to put forward to secure supplies into the long term. Thank you, Daniel. Howard, would you like to uh, add to that or maybe you can just agree with that? Yeah, I, I would support that. And I think an additional thing to say is often the best way to adapt is to make sure that your core services are robust. And it's not a very glamorous topic, but ensuring that, for example, we've got maintenance in our core assets and that they continue to operate and are fit for the future is the bedrock, really, of, of being well adapted. That's not always the case. Sometimes you need to do transformational things, but um, that is really important. And I think the point on lowest bills now is, is not the best answer for the future is, is certainly true. But at the same time, I think Mike's point on there being untapped potential in the um, customer community and in behavioural change, um, and particularly water demand, is true. There is much more that could be done there, but that's not for water companies alone. That's a, a cross-sectoral and including government thing, really. OK, thank you. Um, other blockers or similar ones um, who would like to make a comment? I think um, I, I'd uh, say just slightly harking to what they just said there with, with us we have a bit of a specific odd one around financing which is obviously we have been kept running as a as a, as a sector throughout covid for as a public service for, for getting key workers to and from 
uh, you know, work going forwards. What, what's going to happen to customer demand and numbers? We, we've no idea. And obviously there's a lot of pressure on funding is going to come forwards to, to work out how to run a railway with less people on it. But the, but the other the other the other big barriers, uh, putting aside the the usual ones around sort of behaviour change, are um, in it's still quite difficult sometimes to prove a business case um, until you've proven a business case. So you you, you have to go through the program of, of of piloting or finding something where you can you can drive through the the whole climate change thinking from end to end. So you can work out what the full financial implications are of proper integration rather than bolt on adaptation, which is always expensive. Um, and it's it's still sometimes difficult to start that cycle. Um, and the other one is 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 knowledge. Um, you know, we all have a very good handle on how our day to day assets operate and, and quite often potentially a degree of understanding to one to one extent or another of how weather can impact them. And it's, it's still sometimes difficult to draw the links from operational weather and climate because a lot of the noise in the signal at the weather end is is around other issues human issues on maintenance and and other things so it's quite it's quite interesting mm -hmm. okay thank, thank you david i mean i thought there's a very strong link though between adaptation and an and operational railway and the, the business case would be um i would have thought fairly easy to make but, um, it's obvious, uh, but it's the actual it's the actual costing of it. It's the actual getting the actual numbers that's that's more difficult. Um, mainly, mainly because of the noise in the signal. If you look at what happened in the hot summer uh, in 2019, we had lots of failures in electrical equipment, as in overhead lines. Previous summer, we had lots of failures in rail. We did a lot of work on curing the rail, so then we had all the failures in the in the electrical system because it hadn't failed before because the rail had gone first and then put speed restrictions in so it meant that so that link had not been met people in in the OLE sector were going well we don't have a temperature problem because we've never had one mm. but they hadn't because the rail speeds had gone down in hot weather because of the rail problems yeah. and so it's, it's sometimes the links are, are only there after the fact if that makes sense it's complex, I know, but I can tell you from my experience last week, it's all about the signals. So if you could just that, <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah. Um, okay, has anyone got any other points I'd like to make on this particular question around things that are actual barriers to, to making progress or have been barriers? Yeah, so just one last thing, and it's kind of related to what David was saying about, I think the big, one of the biggest challenges, and it's been touched on already, is around monitoring and evaluation. So that, that is kind of the end of the plan, do, check, act cycle, but it has knock-on effects for, for the rest of it. You need, you need to know what, what you're going to be measuring and how you're going to be judging the success of your actions, really at the planning stage. Um, and there's still big challenges there with adaptation in, in outcome outcome based indicators um, and metrics and how we can kind of ju judge success. So um, that's something I think a lot of people are starting to grapple with and is the next big challenge. Mm. Yes, thank you. Good point. Yeah. Uh, any final points before we move on? OK, jolly good. All right. Now, um, Next question. Um, this is a good one. So to what extent have you as reporting organisations been involved in conversations with other reporting organisations um, or those in your, your sector um, about the approaches to ARP, uh, shared lessons, shared knowledge, that kind of thing? Um, how are you doing with that? Um, I'll, I'll go first on that one. Um, a lot uh, within sector, for sure. Um, so the transport sector has had numerous meetings with uh, DEFRA, DFT, um, ORR um, for us and highways um, on what ARP3 would be. We spend a lot of time developing a sectorial um, template so that whilst we'll all do our own adaptation from reporting, we'll, we'll have our own narrative, tell our own stories. It all follows the same risk assessment template. It all follows the same document template. Um, to to give uh, DEFRA and uh, CCC etc et the ability to cross compare cross sector uh, has been lower but it's still there I actually was on the phone to United Utilities uh, last week about ARP um, and obviously we liaise through a whole number of groups like the Infrastructures uh, Operators Adaptation Forum uh, there's a, there's a, a TAS, TAS, TASG which is the Transport Adaptation Sector Group in London that meets so yeah, it, it could improve cross sector, um, but it but it's happening. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Howard or Daniel, um, cross company working in the water industry is becoming very yeah. place now. Yeah, I'd, I've, I've got a, a, a quick answer to that, I think. So within the water sector, I, I certainly think it's very good in the UK. That there's a number of networks active and there is an adaptation group that, that still meets and discusses reporting approaches and risk assessments and so on. I think there's more scope to do international um, comparison, really. So often a layman question that's mm -hmm. asked is if you're expecting a different climate in the UK in the future, where else in the world has a similar climate or similar extremes that you might face? Um, and I think there's more that could be done there. Um, a, a niche example, we've been working recently with an Australian water company on reducing emissions of nitrous oxide from sewage treatment. They face a very different set of temperatures and operating conditions, but largely the same technology. So there's some lessons to learn there. And I think um, looking internationally is a really helpful way to inform your risk assessment. Yeah. And can I build on that and just say, yeah, we've been doing a lot across sector. Uh, for example, I'm presenting to the Infrastructure Operators Adaptation Forum uh, meeting tomorrow to give a kind of fuller presentation about our uh, third adaptation report. And obviously one of the reasons why we wanted to consult on the draft report uh, last March was to engage other organisations in what we are planning to do to get that feedback to make the report even better. Um, I guess, yeah, as, as Howard said, there's uh, the Water UK uh, teams produced a kind of a, a standardized template for the sector to make sure we're all providing information on a consistent basis. And I think within the water sector, partly because we've been thinking adapt about adaptation for kind of 30 or more years, and um, because as a regulated sector, we've got common metrics that we are reporting on all the time to, to offer what the Environment Agency about pollution incidents, about uh, leakage levels, about metering penetration and so forth which I guess kind of picks up Kay's point about monitoring and evaluation, certainly within the water sector, is relatively straightforward because we can uh, monitor these things on a regularly, uh, regular basis. And, and lastly, just say that we spent quite a bit of time thinking about our interdependencies within the report. So there's a whole section on it, which I encourage people to take a look at, uh, so that we are working very closely with those people we identify. For example, of course, energy suppliers, uh, thinking about where our electricity comes from, but also, as part of our commitment to becoming net zero, we are deliberately becoming our own energy supplier uh, where we can through uh, solar PV, thinking about storage, thinking about uh, how we use our biogas resources and so forth. So addressing uh, both those kind of transition risks to business and then also where possible addressing those independency risks at the same time. Yeah. And Hannah, yes, I'd be really interested in your perspective. On yeah, that. sure. So um, as I mentioned, this is our first climate adaptation report. So we're speaking to a number of people to get their perspectives. Other financial regulators like the Financial Conduct Authority and the Pensions Regulator are also going to be doing their first round of reporting in this, um, in this round. So we're speaking to them quite actively to ensure that as much as possible, our consideration of the risks and our messaging around what we expect of people in the investment chain um, and from companies and lenders is actually coordinated um, and that we can get that, that message out as actively as possible. As James mentioned, the bank has done um, a previous round of reporting where they looked specifically at the insurance sector, but in this round of the reporting, they're going to be covering a wider range of their activities. So it's been quite helpful to speak to the bank about how they went about that, um, that process and for us to coordinate across the four organisations to make sure that, as I say, as much as possible when we're talking about adaptation, we're talking about the same things, we're talking about the same expectations, and we're all pushing in the same direction. Great, thank you. And Kay, of course, the Environment Agency has a strategic overview role, lots of partnership working within the agency and in various respects. Um, have you been able to translate any of that into um, you know, cross-working around uh, adaptation reporting? Um, yeah, I think as you see, a lot of the uh, partnership working we do is embedded within other things. Obviously, we did set up the Infrastructure Operators Adaptation Forum um, back in 2012 in recognition of the importance of talk, talking cross-sectorally about these issues. Um, within our sector, there, I mean, that would be Natural England and Forestry Commission, and there are probably fewer commonalities than perhaps with other sectors. Um, but, but yeah, I think the cross-sector stuff is mostly embedded and then through the, the operators forum. So, yeah. Great, okay, thank, thank you very much. OK, we're going to move to um, another question. And again, it's about um, reporting. And, and really, I think it's touching upon how 
the reporting and the effectiveness of that reporting is, is a real opportunity if we get it right to actually make progress to influence to change mindsets behaviors etc so with um with a view to um last time and, and looking ahead to, to this time what was it in the way that you actually reported last time that made a difference in other words was it presentation of risk um communication with stakeholders what were the most effective things about the way you reported Can I come in on that? Yes, please. Um, yeah, so I think the most effective thing is uh, framing our risks around our corporate objectives. So rather than just presenting random impacts, um, looking looking at the sort of aims and goals uh, for our business as a whole and describing the risks around that worked, worked really well as a way of presenting the risks. Um, we had a really strong governance structure so we had senior level um, project board with clear leadership working level technical groups to get input from across the business and all the right technical expect expertise with clear contact points that sort of thing we also used um, a planning scenario as a risk screening tool so looking at um, a, a consistent set of climate projections and their impacts um, nicely presented as an infographic to to, to kind of help people visualize what what the risks would be is that initial screening. I think those were the main things. Okay, thank you, Kay. Anyone else like to remind yeah. that? Can I come in? So on our third report, I covered it very briefly, but essentially this is the first time where we've tried to actually define in a way that's consistent with our corporate risk register, uh, both what the, the kind of raw level of risk would be if we took no action, where we are currently on that risk management journey and where we'd like to get to both in 2025 and what the kind of long-term target level of risk will be. And that recognises that we're not going to be able to reduce risk to zero. There is you know, an acceptable uh, and appropriate and cost-effective level of risk that we should achieve. And in some cases, we're quite close to that. But in other cases, we've clearly got some distance to go. And I think that's really been helpful to both define for ourselves, you know, just, just realistically, where are we on this journey? and to recognise that there'll always be a need for that kind of resilience, I suppose, that be, to be able to recover quickly, to be able to respond to events as they occur, and to make sure that we're ready to kind of protect customers, which of course is ultimately uh, the aim of everything that we're trying to do in this space. Thank you, Daniel. Anyone else like to come in on that? I think one of the most effective things that the ARP gives you is a simple, if you can summarise it, list of what your risks are that you can then take to people who perhaps haven't considered climate change before and say, have you considered these things in your planning? So having that very simple list of this type of future will mean this type of impact for us. Is that considered? That goes a long way in getting it considered and worked into planning. If you haven't got that, it's all a bit amorphous and people just look at the very widespread of potential scenarios. It can be very difficult to do anything about. But once you've got that simple list of risks, it's, it's much more um, much more usable for people. Thank you. OK, I mean, I think there's a question here from uh, Nikki Van Dyke that maybe follows on from this little bit and it's a question around how is adaptation reporting viewed at different levels um, within um, organizations for example um, you know board level operational level etc again so i come in so um so, so the basic ethos is that climate change adaptation is integrated into everything that we do that it's not you know, the ARP report was not an exercise that was done to one side and kind of bolted onto the business, kind of retrofitted into the business strategy. It's absolutely core to the business strategy. And that's reflected the reason why it's our chief executive that signed off the report. There were board level discussions to make sure that everyone was happy with the, uh, the assessment that's being made and whether or not, obviously, there are certain aspects of the risk that we need to be uh, managing. Um, I think it's also to recognise that, you know, as we talked about earlier, it's part of our uh, task force of climate related financial disclosures return, uh, which we've done three times. And also our general approach to climate change, both in becoming a net zero uh, business by 2030 and having a strong story to tell on adaptation was core to us being given an A rating by CDP in their latest climate change assessment for Christmas. You know, we're the only water company to get that A rating and we're very proud of it. But what that means in practice is that we can then uh, sell our business to investors. Uh, we, we can attract the right kind of investors who have the long term uh, view in mind, pension funds and other institutional investors who are willing to invest in the business. 
and also means that we can attract, even if it's by a couple of basis points on the cost of capital for the billions of pounds of investment that bring in, that makes a real financial difference to our bottom line. So having a good climate change story to tell, being a net zero carbon business is absolutely uh, core to our kind of ESG uh, credentials and, and is having, say, tangible impacts on the cost of borrowing um, going forward. Mm, thank you. I think I've... David, beat me please, the, yeah. That Dan beat me to the punch there. Um, I think it, it, the short answer to the question, what does it mean, is it depends on where your company is on the journey. Um, you could probably mirror it back with sort of environmental reporting uh, many, many years ago. It initially maybe starts out as a, you know, a nice to do or a, um, it, it, it's seen as a, um, a, a, a reputation seller or something. But once you have done it once or twice and they understand the mechanism and, and once the issue of climate change and climate change adaptation becomes core to your business planning, it becomes recognised as a strategic planning tool. And I think that's where um, you know, I, I can remember that journey at Anglian Water and I think that's when they were at right? this, this, as of now, climate change is, is uh, now a level zero risk, which may not mean anything to anybody else, but it's our top level of corporate risk. It's been moved from one to zero. So it's now a board managed risk. The adaptation report is going to be signed off and reviewed by the board because they see it as part of the, the, the journey of, of integrating and delivering the solution to this risk. Um, and as I said, it's going to be aligned with our recently um, published, as I said last year, our environmental sustainability strategy, which lays out our strategy for the next 50 years. So it, it, it becomes part and parcel of the strategic delivery. How it's then seen within the different parts of the business going down the chain, shall we say, it depends on the level of communication and what you're doing and, and the degree to which you engage the various teams towards the front line. Um, it, again, that's a journey. Um, it, it's about making it relevant to people's roles and jobs and making them understand what the risk of climate change is to their ability to deliver their service to the company and the customer. Uh, and again, I think we're, we're on that journey. I think we, we've, we've, We've improved from last time. Um, we're not just doing this as a central strategic thing. It now involves our routes and regions and they're engaged in actually delivering the actions in the plan, generating the actions in the plan. So now it's it's a, a much more accepted part of the business day to day than, than, than a, a report. OK, thank you. I mean, what I would add to that is, that, yes, the reporting is a, is a very um, integral part or needs to be a very integral part of planning, but it's also about influencing and winning hearts and minds as well. And I think being able to translate that reporting into something that, that's meaningful to the different um, operations and, 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 and um, aspects of your organisations is, is a really important going forward, I would suggest. Um, Sorry, Howard's point about that was, was really valid and it was sort yeah. of what I said in my um piece about what, what the value is to us. At its most basic level, it provides a punchy set of graphs, tables, messages, bullet points. It lays out for people in a way that they can read it in a few pages. What's the core offering here? What's, what's the point, what the takeaway message is? Mm. It summarizes a lot of very complicated work in the background. Yeah, indeed. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to move on swiftly now to a final question. We've just got a minute or two to take this. Um, so again, perhaps some, some succinct answers, please. But it's, um, it's a, a, com a comment or a question from, um, from Gerard Davis about how um, you're collecting data from down the value chain, um, supply chain in, in your organizations. Um, you know, and are you interested in what SMEs are doing, for example, that are an integral part of your of your um, operations? So who would like to give an answer to that, please? Working with supply chain. Um, I'd say that's our next challenge or our current challenge. Um, we've spent a lot of time understanding our risks. We've spent a lot of time developing our guidance, our, our capabilities internally to think about climate change and where it will hit us and what we need to do about it. And we're now moving into the arena of delivery properly. And there's a big recognition within this, I mean, particularly when you're dealing with large infrastructure, and in our case, very old infrastructure, 200-year-old embankments and the like, and tunnels that can't just be closed and rebuilt. Um, a lot of innovation in the supply chain is going to be needed and partnership to, to deliver adaptation. We cannot do it alone, and we cannot do it through solely capital investment in carbon-intensive concrete or whatever. Thank you, David. Uh, any final thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I'd just say, um, so just on capital carbon, for example, we've set ourselves a capital carbon target, had that for 10 years. And actually focusing on carbon means that you're also thinking differently about the assets that you construct. Uh, and for example, taking you much more towards nature-based solutions because they are both uh, have low carbon footprints operationally, but involve much lower carbon footprints in terms of the, the, uh, the capital cost of those, uh, those works, much less co uh, concrete, much less steel, much more kind of nature-based solutions. Uh, and so and one of the things that we are uh, encouraging and I suppose incentivizing our suppliers to do is to think differently, more in a kind of six capitals approach, rather than just trying to kind of pitch the lowest cost solutions in response to a particular kind of operational needs. And so, yeah, the supply chain is absolutely kind of key to what we're doing. Uh, and through those kind of long-term alliance partnerships we've got that last, in some cases, 15 years, we've, we've got the right incentives in place to come to, for them to be bringing forward uh, solutions that both meet the, the, the climate change challenge, but also, as I say, the, the nature emergency too. Thank you. And Hannah Kay, would you like the, the last word in the final 20 seconds we, we've got? No. <laughs> If I can, very, very quickly, I think that's another yes. example of where we've we've learned from experiences. So chemicals is a classic example, key supply chain for us. We absolutely rely on those chemicals. We've seen occasions when there's been risks to that supply chain and we've done things about it to strategically try and cope. So some of that adaptation is, is happening. More to do, I think. And on carbon reduction, some of weaning ourselves off fossil fuels in the supply chain, for example, does help as well on the adaptation journey. Yeah, thank you. OK. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to stop the, uh, the questions there, otherwise I will be in a lot of trouble with the team for running over time. Um, but I'd just like to say a massive thank you to uh, all of you and our speakers this morning for what's been a really fascinating two hours. It could easily have been eight hours, I think. Um, and uh, let's hope the conversation do continue. Um, I'd like to um, thank WRC as, uh, for sponsoring this event. Uh, we, we cannot put these events on without that kind of support. Um, there's a lot of um, work and, and time and money that goes into producing these and um, that support is very much appreciated. So thank you to, to WRC um, and also uh, to CCW as well for your support. Um, also, um, so that's, I'm afraid, the, the end of, of, of our session, but please do not go anywhere because uh, this is our first venture into this new digital platform that uh, you're viewing through today. And it's got uh, loads of functionality in it and lots of opportunity in it to network and find out more. So please uh, don't go away, please take time to visit the exhibitor booth and to hear from CCW and WRC and also SIWEM membership and learning teams are also available for a chat there. Um, there's also a networking space as well uh, where you can chat with your fellow attendees. So if you had a particular question and or you want some sort of discussion to go on, there's your opportunity to do that. Um, now we will be producing a post event report, which we will send to all of you in uh, the next few weeks. And also we have recorded this session as well. So it will be available uh, to you in about 72 hours time um, through our YouTube channel. Okay. And uh, finally, we do really want to hear your feedback. We are constantly looking at how we can refine and improve our webinars and make them more engaging for you. Um, so please do um, give us your feedback. Uh, you can do so in the poll area on Slido. Um, and if you have two minutes um, to, uh, to do that, that'd be, um, that'd be really great. Thank you. Um, and as I said right at the start, please do get in touch. Uh, SIWEM is a fantastically varied organisation with uh, much, much to, to offer uh, and, and a lot to do as well. So um, please do engage with us and um, you know, get in contact with me or anyone else in the team if you'd like to chat about anything. So um, that's it. I will now wish you all a really great afternoon. Uh, the weather's improving, so uh, that makes us all feel better. And uh, Please do stay safe and uh, we hope to see you all again soon at a future event. Thank you very much.